16 of the world's airlines on the threshold of the supersonic age. Customers for the Anglo-French Concorde, the first supersonic airliner in the world. In 1969, time and space collapsed when man flew through the skies at 1,300 miles per hour. And then it suddenly ended. The Concorde flew off into the sunset today, ending, at least for now, the era of supersonic passenger travel. Really unique in the history of technology is to have a capability and then lose it. Now this technological marvel is on its way back. We're going to see renewed progress in air travel. and My long-term mission at Boom is to make that happen. Today, man is planning for the development of a supersonic transport. Back in the 1960s, the future of flight was supposed to be supersonic. A commercial airliner that will cruise at speeds up to 2,000 miles per hour. When the Concorde made its commercial debut in 1976, it was an engineering marvel that represented the technological promise of the 20th century. The first Concorde swooped down out of a bright sunshine sky like some prehistoric bird of prey. But 27 years after its initial flight, the Concorde landed for the final time, ending the era of civilian supersonic travel. So why did the airliner of the future become a museum artifact? The first airplane came from bicycle entrepreneurs. The first practical airliner, the DC-3, was created by a founder-led company. And they had to produce aircraft that made economic sense. Blake Scholl is the founder and CEO of an aviation startup called Boom Technology that's trying to revive supersonic air travel. But with supersonics, we changed that. And instead of building an airplane that made sense, we build airplanes for national prestige. Concorde was always a state-funded white elephant. So when costs went up and ticket sales dropped, the French and British governments who were backing the venture decided to pull out. Another factor that hobbled the evolution of supersonic flight was an overland speed limit imposed in both the US and Europe. The speed ban was pushed by environmental activists who claimed the bang from sonic booms would be the loudest noise ever and would be the equivalent of a bomb blast to nearby buildings. People talk about, oh, it's a sonic boom, and we can't have sonic booms. So if that was the case, there would have been a noise limit, not a speed limit. 14 years after the Concorde was grounded, private companies are on the verge of bringing supersonic air travel back. And this time, it'll be built to last. Boom Technologies aircraft will mainly fly over water, and the company has devised a new form factor, a three-engine jet that can carry up to 55 passengers and flies more than twice the speed of sound, cutting transatlantic travel times nearly in half. And while a ticket for the Concorde would originally set you back about 15 grand in today's dollars, Boom expects to charge $5,000 round trip from London to New York. On board, it's significantly more comfortable than Concorde, so it'll be like flying first class domestic in the US. Nice wide seat, tray table, and my personal favorite feature is a cup holder that is nowhere close to where you put your laptop. Boom is taking advantage of a variety of innovations that have come along in the last 50 years. Concorde was designed in wind tunnels, where each iteration takes about six months, and therefore you just can't test many ideas. And today you can do all your aerodynamic development and software simulation, which means that for almost no money, you can test thousands of ideas. Concorde is an aluminum aircraft, limited heat capability, limited ability to form it to the shape you want. And today we have carbon fiber composites, the same stuff that's flying on a Boeing 787 or an Airbus 350. And that lets you build a strong, lightweight structure that's any shape you want, which is really important for supersonics because uh, the ideal design of a supersonic airplane has virtually no straight lines on it. It's a uh, patchwork of uh, flowing, beautiful, curving surfaces. Concorde famously was the only passenger airplane to ever fly with an afterburner. And if you're an airplane geek like I am, like afterburners are just the coolest thing because they're uh, flame coming out the back of the engine, they're loud, they turn heads. But if you're an airline, you hate them because the flame scares passengers and the noise causes people to call their congressmen. And last but not least, they're incredibly fuel inefficient. Uh, and today we have something called a turbofan. It's the same kind of engine technology that's on other commercial aircraft. And effectively what we're doing at Boom is adapting it to supersonic flight. Boom isn't alone in its quest to speed up air travel. It has several private competitors and NASA is working with the engineering firm Lockheed Martin to come up with its own version of a supersonic plane. Scholl says it's a waste of money. We're building a small supersonic demonstrator aircraft that's going to cost us less than $30 million. NASA's paying Lockheed will be close, I think, to $300 million to do essentially the same thing. So private industry is able to do this roughly an order of magnitude 
uh, cheaper than government and also without requiring any taxpayer money. Current regulations will prevent companies like Boom from offering supersonic flights between California and New York. Before they can enter that market, the FAA would need to overturn its ban on overland travel. Reverse that, and now New York to San Francisco could be two hours and 20 minutes. Boom revealed their design for the XB-1 demonstrator jet last November and is working with Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic to build and test the prototype in 2017. We're fans of speed, so we're doing this as quickly as possible. So the first airplane, the XB-1 supersonic demonstrator, will fly in about a year. And uh, after that, we know that all the technology works, the materials are working, the aerodynamics are what we need them to be. Blake hopes that if supersonic flight can catch on with business travelers, market forces will do their work by improving technology and bringing down costs making supersonic flight accessible to the masses. The state of the art for how airlines compete today is, you know, hey, fly our airplane, we've got a great lounge and we've got better champagne. But nobody wants a longer flight, everyone would love to get there in half the time, and this is a chance for airlines to make it significantly more faster.